Assemble, please, for the last session of the day. My name is Graham Chesters, and I chair the Philip Barkin Society, and it's my pleasure to give you a, a second welcome uh, late in the afternoon. Um, it's also my pleasure to introduce two people who need no introduction, so I'm not going to give any. <laughs> Especially since they've not given me any bio. So um, <laughs> they're going to do it themselves. But they're, they're, they're well accustomed to this. You know, they're, they're normally on tour in the north of England, in Sheffield and uh, Hull. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a pleasure. Ships in the Sky. Uh, those of you who are not from Hull, you might, know, might not know what it is, but uh, you will soon. All right, thank you, Esther and Vicky. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks so much um, for inviting us today to speak together. It's a little bit something different, <laughs> being a bit of a double act here. <laughs> and we're, we're talking about sort of two, two different but also connected things. So um, I'm sure you all know Vicky. Um, I'm Esther Johnson. I'm a, an artist and filmmaker who's from Hull, but I'm a prof in film and media arts at Sheffield Hannam Uni, so it's always great to be back in Hull. Um, so I, I create work that centres on discovering um, and presenting alternative or mar mar marginal social histories. Um, and the, this particular project, um, Ships in the Sky, is a social history arts project that attempts to create a multi-layered, 360-degree portrait of a specific place through time. So most importantly, the project looks at the significance of place making through one structure in Hull City Centre and its remarkable public artworks by an artist called Alan Boyson. And the largest being his uh, Three Ships Mosaic, which is this illustration here. Um, which is the most visible piece of public artwork, I think, in Hull, but it's also the largest mosaic in the country. From the research I've done, it seems to be so. So as part of this project, I commissioned Vicky to uh, write a crown of sonnets for the project. You can explain what that is, Vicky. <laughs> um, and as inspiration, I gave her access to um, some of the oral histories that have recorded for the project. So we've recorded over 100 oral testimonies now from people connected to the building in some way, whether that's shoppers, workers, um, the architects, builders, clubbers. Um. So yeah, as I said, my work, it centres on alternative marginal social histories of people and places through film, photography, and through oral testimonies and exhibitions of that work. <laughs> And I am a writer and PhD researcher with a particular interest in northern cities, class and transformation. And the way that's going to play into this talk today is we're going to talk about the impact that art can have on our sense of ourselves, both individually and as communities, because it's huge, we think. And I've worked on a number of projects based around Hull over the last six years, spanning 2017, our City of Culture year, which have explored these ideas. So just to start off with, um, so alongside the obvious uh, depiction of three ships in Alan Boyson's mural, uh, which we saw on the previous slide, this particular quote here, which is from one of my absolute favourite books, Walden, um, written in 1894 by Henry David Thoreau, was also kind of spark or uh, um, inspiration for the title of the project, Ships in the Sky. So just to uh, quote Thoreau, I learned this at least by my experiments, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavours to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Skipping to near the end, in proportion as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty poverty, nor weakness weakness. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. Hull was the second most bombed city during the Second World War. 
Historic England tells us that Hull suffered severe destruction through bombing. As many as 95% of its buildings were destroyed. And that in just one night in May 1941, over 70 German planes dropped tons of high explosives and over 9,000 incendiary bombs in Hull. That kind of devastation of a place is just about unimaginable for us. And there's no wonder that the whole city remained very much under construction for decades afterwards. My dad used to tell me stories about playing in the bombed out buildings that still scattered the city as he was growing up in the late 50s and early 60s and of life growing up on the newly built council estates at the edges of the city. The ice on the insides of windows, the coats laid over the shared beds to keep them all warm, the constant battle his mum, my granny, had fought to keep her family of six from being hungry. The make-do-amend mentality, the fields that ran out and away from the rows of houses, how these were a sanctuary for them all, a playground. For him, as for many people who grew up in the city or lived on those estates at that time, this was normal. He didn't think too much about it, he just lived in it every day. These are some of the reasons that Hull and the people living here have a strong belief in their own resilience and strength their ability for surviving and getting by. It's easy to draw a line between that past and that belief in the present. But where did the sense of artistry, beauty and the potential for artistic creation come from? I think that Larkin, arriving in the city in 1955, played a huge part in that. While these conditions may have been unremarkable to the people living here, Larkin saw it all with fresh eyes, and in 1961, he set to work writing about it in here. His poetry workbooks, housed at the Hull History Centre, contain 10 pages of drafts of the poem, written between the 6th of September and the 8th of October 1961, and they make for fascinating examination. But Larkin himself, writing in a letter on the 11th of September, just a few drafts in, describes it as a pointless, shapeless thing about Hull. The workbooks show us that at this point, he's still at the messy, early construction stage of the poem. The first draft of the first stanza reads, Swerving east, away from money shadows and the important traffic north, to fields too thin and thistled to be called meadows, and an occasional harsh named halt that shields workmen at dawn, swerving to loneliness of skies and scarecrows, hedges, hares and pheasants, and the enormous river's slow presence. The pillars, the central ideas, the foundations and rafters of what this stanza will become exist here. The next day, Larkin works again, works again on the construction, or maybe the unearthing of the poem, and some of its most beautiful elements emerge. On the 7th of September, he writes of the rich industrial shadows, all night traffic going north, the widening river's slow presence, and maybe most crucially for me, for the first time, the piled gold clouds the shining gold mud. The Cooperative Society in Hull has a long history of having a grand department store in Hull City Centre. The Hull Cooperative Central Emporium in Jameson Street was built in stages from 1908 to opening for business on the 29th of August of the same year. The Emporium reached full size in 1935. Two years later, trolley buses were introduced throughout Hull, including one that passed the main entrance of the Cooperative Central Emporium. In 1939, the Women's Cooperative Guild Annual Congress took place in Hull. Proceedings were held in Hull City Hall, with a tour of the Grand Jameson Street Co-op store offered to Congress delegates. The Guild membership peaked in 1939, with over 8,000 um, women and almost 2,000 branches across the UK. In researching for Ships in the, in the Sky, I actually found a film of this outing um, in the co-op archives held in Manchester. So on the night of the 7th 
to the 8th of May 1941 during the infamous Hull Blitz, the co-op down Jamerson Street was bombed along with many other city centre buildings. Hull was the second most bombed city outside of London and, as Vicky pointed out, 95% of its buildings suffered bomb damage. With no central co-op department store available to Hull residents after the bombing, a temporary one-storey premises was opened in November 1947, known locally as the Prefab. In 1948, the Co-op Wholesale Society Architects Department in Manchester designed the layout and internal fittings for the first large-scale self-service shop in the UK, leading the way for a new kind of department store and shopping experience. In 1955, the first stage of building commenced on the new permanent Hull and East Riding Cooperative Society store on the same site at 32 to 38 Jameson Street. The build for a new department store was a long, protracted process that went through four stages, with sections of the building opened individually as the build progressed. During this period, the co-op continued to train on the site in the prefab and concurrently in the new building with each section when each section was completed. On the 21st of November, 1963, Hull Daily Mail wrote, the 10-year development plan was put into operation when Mr. A. B. Barnes became general manager and secretary in 1953 Mr. Barnes came to Hull from Woodhouse, Sheffield, and one of his first jobs was to work out a war damage claim for the former co-op store, which was blitzed in 1941. Work on the building as we know it today began in 1955, stage two was stopped two years later, and stage three in 1960. With the completion of stage four next year, the entire store will be completely fitted out with the most modern equipment. On what was one of the largest co-ops in the country, with a total of 234,000 square feet. The store's final statistics included four floors, five entrances, four main staircases, four passenger and three goods lifts, escalators to all levels and a sales area of 146,000 square feet. The general office included a 100 foot long banking counter, and one of the most modern suites in the north of England. The store was reported to have cost 1,970,000 less war damage claims and allowances of 590,000, although an independent valuer estimated its worth at 4 million on the open market. At the, same st at the same time as these first stages of the rebuilding of the Hull Co-op, the first librarian of the University College Hall, Agnes Cumming, retired in 1955. In late 1954, the college gained its royal charter, empowering it to award its own degrees. And with 125,000 books and no purpose-built library, plans to build a modern library fell to Larkin. Stage one of the new Brimmore Jones Library was completed in September 59, with stage two including the modern nine-storey tower block opening in July 69. Ten years later, my mum was working here as a secretary and she also managed to get her dad, my grandfather, a job as a car park attendant and caretaker. An early draft of the second stanza of here written on the 10th of September 61 reads, here services at sea level laid down like tree roots run to suburbs where the trolleys turn at the end of hideous miles. Two days later, on the 12th of September, Larkin tries out his first descriptions of the people living in Hull. Fair haired, cheap clothed in open air they wander, Urban yet simple, straying to the pier past doors marked consulate, shipbroker, chandler, to watch the ferry wait and go. On the 15th he writes, a cut price crowd, urban yet simple, dwelling where only salesmen and relations come, the pastoral of an end, its taxis smelling familiarly of fish. And on the 20th, he tries, within a terminal and fishy smelling pastoral of ships, 
a slave, mu a slave museum, tattoo shops, drab dentured headscarfed women and hospitals, long dingy lighty lands open all night. Other workings are so well crossed out that it's impossible to know what was written. But what we can see is the constant discarding of ideas and images that aren't working, the constant reworking and reimagining, the way he maps out the city in his mind, editing and feeling it out. Not so different to the physical building process that was taking place at the same time. Not so different to the way a place's sense of itself might be reworked and reimagined. It's possible to observe the distillation of ideas emerging over the course of 11 pages of drafts in this one workbook, to see how the rhythm emerges, the lyricism overpowers some of the meaner descriptions, and the whole work is smoothed out before the final stunning stanza emerges. Larkin doesn't begin work on the final eight lines of the poem until the other stanzas are almost completed. Maybe as though he needs to be able to climb up on top of them to see out towards where he'll end up. But in the very next legible draft we have the mortgaged half-built edges and fast-shadowed wheat fields which isolate villages whose removed lives and there this draft ends abruptly. Larkin doesn't say what happens to these removed lives until three days later. But on the 2nd of October he continues grow clean by loneliness. Here silence stands like heat or tam. Here leaves unnoticed thicken, weeds come to flower, neglected waters quicken, luminously peopled air ascends. The very next page has the poem whole, almost exactly as it'll be published in the Wits and Weddings three years later. And as I will read it for the first time 35 years later, 11 years after Larkin's death. Unlike my dad, I'll emerge into a city not beleaguered by bombed out plots. I will have shopped every Saturday, overlooked by boys and ships, and I will know by the age of 16 that the sliding brown humber is not just any old river, it is a widening, slow presence with piled gold clouds and shining gold marks mud. Five years before Larkin wrote his poem here, architects in the Manchester head offices of the Cooperative Society were drawing up initial plans for a shiny new Hull and East Riding Cooperative Society central premises, the largest Hullard scene. At the same time as a former pupil of Hull Trinity House School for seafarers and mariners, my dad started to sail around the world with the Merchant Navy. The architect tasked with designing the new store was Chief Architect Edward Philip Andrews, working under G.S. Hay of the CWS Architects Department in Manchester. Philip adapted a rudimentary initial outline into an exciting modern building including a remarkable concrete dome, of which at the time the only other like it was to be found in the Kremlin. Responding to the co-op's principle of including public art to unite the community on many of their buildings, Philip commissioned his childhood friend, Alan Boyson, to create public artworks to the new hall structure. In the same year as Larkin wrote here in 61, Alan Boyson completed the fish mural, which you'll see shortly, and Hellensians began dancing on the sprung maple dance floor of the Skyline Ballroom at the top of the building. Two years later, in 63, the building would be completed with Boyson's three ships mosaic mural as the jewel in this very large crown. When I was growing up, the three ships would be the springboard for my dad to tell me all of his seafaring adventures um, and about his first trip to Romance and the Arctic Circle when he was barely a teenager. On 17th of October, 63, the Hull Daily Mail wrote, Five men in Hull have nearly finished a jigsaw with more than a million pieces. For six weeks now, they have been working, watched by shoppers and city workers, on the 80-foot high mosaic mural which dominates the front of the city's new cooperative store. Given good weather, the mural, believed to be Britain's biggest, will be finished in about a fortnight, and the people of 
whole, we'd be the first to see what it looks like in one piece. For so far, it has only been laid out on the ground in sections. The five men fixing gang from Leeds are putting it up in foot square numbered slabs, each slab made up of 20, 225 tiny cubes mounted on a paper backing. They have no pattern. Said foreman fixer, Richard Fletcher, we just play it by ear as we go. When the gang started work, they discovered that the mosaic was four cubes, a little over two inches, narrower than the curved 66 by 64 feet concrete screen on which it was mounted. Four cubes does not seem much, but it meant a lot to us, said Mr. Fletcher. The mosaic contains well over a million pieces, all imported, especially from Italy. The co-op commissioned Wolverhampton artist Alan Boyson to, de to, de to design it. The contemporary design is meant to symbolise Hull's fishing industry. What Hull thinks it symbolises will doubtless become plain when the scaffolding comes down probably next month. I think it may be a little bit much for people at first, said Mr Fletcher. He has been fixing mosaics for 12 years now and the co-op mural is three times bigger than anything he's, he's tackled before. But it has presented few problems, and rain, the mosaic fixer's biggest enemy, has halted work on only two days. Needless to say, there has been no trouble from the other big hazard, too much sun, which drives the fixing cement too quickly. At the request of Hull's town planners, the design is in muted colours, but there is no fear that the pale greens and browns will lose their tones. One of the biggest advantages of glass mosaic is that it is not affected by the weather. Swerving east from rich industrial shadows and traffic all night north, swerving through fields too thin and thistle to be called meadows, and now and then a harsh named halt that shields workmen at dawn. Swerving to solitude of skies and scarecrows, haystacks, hares and pheasants, and the widening river's slow presence, the piled gold clouds, the shining gull marked mud gathers to the surprise of a large town. Here domes and statues, spires and cranes cluster beside grain scattered streets, barge crowded water and residents from raw states brought down the dead straight miles by steel in flat faced trolleys, pushed through plate glass swing doors to their desires. Cheap suits, red kitchenware, sharp shoes, ice lollies, electric mixers, toasters, washers, dryers, a cup price crowd, urban yet simple, dwelling up where only salesmen and relations come, within a terminate and fishy smelling pastoral of ships up streets, the slave museum, tattoo shops, consulates, grim head scarved wives, and out beyond its mortgaged half built edges, fast shadowed wheat fields, running high as hedges, isolate villages, where removed lives, loneliness clarifies. Here silence stands like heat, here leaves unnoticed thicken, hidden weeds flower, neglected waters quicken, luminously peopled air ascends, and past the poppy's bluish neutral distance ends the land suddenly beyond a beach of shapes and shingle. Here is unfenced existence, facing the sun, untalkative, out of reach. I've had a look there with artist Alan Boyce and Three Ships Mural for as long as I can remember. Seeing this 66 by 60 foot tall, foot, 64 foot concrete curved screen with glittering mosaic comprising of a million glass tesserae never ceases to grow. In fact, this whole city centre, unable to miss artwork adorning the main entrance of the co op, was, uh, which was later a British home stores, was formative in my research for modernism and also the desire to, to move and go and study art. It was in 1961 that Alan Boyson was commissioned by Philip Andrews 
The final, mu the final mural was unveiled in 1963 and responds uh, directly to co ops brief to unite the community through art. Alan's design is a direct nod to Hull's thriving fishing industry with the depiction of three distinct trawlers in simple silhouette with double masts and a rear swim boom, which was typical of the trawlers um, seen in Hull in the 50s and 60s. The trawlers are sailing in choppy waters above the Latin inscription, Respa Industrium Prosperity through Industry. Five years later, in 1968, there was Hull's triple trawler tragedy with the death of 58 crew members. Although not initially made as a memorial to this, being made you know, years before, Boyson's mosaic has become a poignant reminder of that tragedy and of a time of the fishy smelling pastoral of ships up streets. In addition to the three ships, Boyson was also commissioned to create two handcrafted smaller works outside and inside the top floor skyline ballroom, becoming the only building to contain three Boyson artworks. The first of these smaller works is the magnificent fish mural that was rediscovered by ceramic tile expert Christopher Marsden in 2010. In this photograph here, donated to the project, you can see a group of co-op window dressers who had, quote, scared off work to take a look at the new mural, mural <laughs> shortly after this had been completed. The memories of these ladies have been recorded for Ships in the Sky, along with a plumber who recalled having to unblock the drains which Boyson had inadvertently clogged with fragments of tiles, ceramics and concrete, as he was, quote, a messy worker. <laughs> a research interview with Philip Andrew in 2018 for the project resulted in the rediscovery of a further forgotten Boyson mural in the fourth floor ballroom. This is an internal geometric sponge print tiled mural of which most of the upper half remains, but um, by my count, 387 tiles are missing from the lower section. Alan Boyson's son, uh, discovered a box of these tiles when Alan died back in 2018 and he gifted one of these to the project. Philip Larkin, The Complete Poems, tells us that on the 8th of October 1961, Larkin wrote in a letter, Last night I finished a dull poem called Here about ye eastern thridden. And that in a letter in 1962, Larkin described the poem as being plain description. His drafts prove that to be untrue, though. The care given to the poem and the descriptions is almost loving, and by extension demonstrates his love of Hull, which is backed up by further accounts in the complete poems. Larkin, in 1981, when asked whether he intended the poem as a brief for retirement, the simpler life said, and it feels very strange saying Larkin's words in my Hull accent, but said, oh no, not at all. <laughs> well, it depends what you mean by retirement. If you mean not living in London, I suppose it might be interpreted along those lines. I meant it just as a celebration of here, Hull. It's a fascinating area, not quite like anywhere else. Then talking about Hull on the South Bankshire on the 30th of May 1982, he said, the lonely place is always, to me, the exciting place. I first read Larkin in 1996, in an upstairs classroom at Wilberforce College in Hull, when my A-level English tutor handed out copies, actually that specific copy, <laughs> which is, I probably suppose, stolen property now from 13 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> handed out copies of the Wits and Weddings. On the first page, as I devoured here, I experienced a sense of recognition of the place Larkin was writing about. When my tutor explained that the poem was indeed about Hull, that Larkin had lived here until his death in 1985, I felt a pang of loss, because I'd never felt so close to a poet before. I'd never seen this place, my city, written about in this way. Although I'd loved poetry, I'd been reading Hardy and Wordsworth, and although I'd visited Dorset and the Lakes, I didn't know them like I knew Hull. That reading and my subsequent learning about Larkin was transformational for me. It showed me that poetry was possible here, and not just in idyllic, rolling countryside places. 
It was crucial for me that Larkin's descriptions were so. Um, it was crucial for me that Larkin's descriptions were so accurate, that he includes the fishy smell, the raw estates and the mud, that they're captured with such beauty and allowed to sit next to other, more beautiful descriptions of the landscape. His craft, I feel, elevates him, so that the place is allowed to be itself but is also transformed, lifted out of and away from descriptions and unfavourable comparisons made in newspapers. Sidemen in 2006 wrote, at the very heart of what it means to be human is the ability of people to symbolise their experience through language. To understand human behaviour means to understand the use of language. Recounting narratives of experience has been the major way throughout recorded history that humans have made sense of their experience. I never wonder whether I would have felt permission to write without Larkin's words, because I was doing it long before I met him in the pages of books. But I do wonder whether I would have felt I could share my writing about Hull in places like BBC Studios and have it beamed into the ears of millions of people. It's impossible to know because I did have him. If I had clouds, they were piled and golden, and the mud was shining and gold marked. I knew it was okay for the difficult and ugly to sit beside the beautiful and transcendent. It showed me that in this poem, and in doing it, it became part of the structure, the mosaic, the foundations of what I felt I was allowed to do or be. And in speaking to people on projects I've worked on across the city, I feel like that probably spreads out along, among lots of other people who come from here. So maybe he had a direct impact on what the city felt it was allowed to be. Public art can frequently provoke a Marmite effect. And Boyson's mural, and, and maybe even Larkin to some extent, um, is loved but also loathed by some. In 2016, when BHS, who had occupied part of the building since the summer of uh, 1970, when they went into administration and the building was boarded up. At this point, alarm bells went off for both myself, members of the Hull Heritage Action Group, and also the 20th Century Society, um, who I'm a member of. As to, obviously, the precarious future of Boyce's artwork and also the building behind it. It wasn't until 2017 that I contacted Hull Heritage Action Group and the seeds of ships in the sky were planted. The group had started an online campaign to get three ships listed, and this campaign, alongside the development of Ships in the Sky, proved that the shared love in the city and beyond the three ships, and the many pertinent memories that the building evoked from people across generations, from those that worked and shopped in the co-op and VHS, to public art and modernist enthusiasts, to clubbers who fre frequented the building's nightclubs, the Skyline Ballroom in the 60s, Baileys in the 70s and later Romeo, Romeo's and Juliet's that had a dramatic closure in 1993 after a large-scale police drugs raid. Boyson's Three Ships belongs to the fabric of Hull and its people. It belongs to the heritage of the city's remarkable fishing industry. It belongs to the headscarfed women and their grandchildren buying their children's babies' clothes and modern appliances for their first homes at the shiny department store. It belongs to teenagers with memories of meeting their first sweetheart or groups of friends who used the mural as a meeting point. It belongs to clubbers swooning at the sight of Jimi Hendrix, Eartha Kiss, John Lee Hooker, the Kinks, and those experiencing their first rave. And it belongs to the poets and the dreamers who, like both myself and Vicky as children, see a hopeful image pointing to a future voyage of where might lead us. Ships in the Sky embraces the shared love and the intoxicating power of memory and of place. In late 2019, and in a last attempt to get the mural listed, myself and friends rallied round for signatories for an open letter to the DCMS. On the 21st of November, the same year, Historic England granted three ships Grade 2 listing status, which was a significant victory for Hull. Advocate of history from below um, and the social historian Raphael Samuel, 
states in his book, Theatres of Memory, that it is the little platoons rather than the great society which command attention in this new version of the national past, the spirit of place rather than that of the common law or the institutions or representative governments. In line with the history workshop movement, Ships in the Sky aims to involve citizens as both subjects and practitioners of history. During the 2020 lockdown, when people were unable to visit many places that they held dear and community togetherness became enacted in a different way, in response to this and the increased demand on food banks at the time, I designed t-shirts, tote bags, spinal slip mats, all of the images of bison's fish and ships in order to raise money for Hull and UK food banks. In fact, there's a food bank just to the left of the three ships mural. So this helped them directly. And in, in order to share the campaign on social media, I invited several poets, including Vicky, and writers to film themselves uh, reciting a verse of Larkin's 1945 poem, The North Ship. And I would like, I would like to have finished our presentation today showing that film, but if, if we can't get the sound to work, we can go to the if you lift the laptop up to the... Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second, let's... Let's see here, if I do that... Let's give it a go. You probably are quite familiar with the poem. I saw three ships go sailing by Over the sea, the lifting sea And the wind rose in the morning sky And one was rigged for a long journey the first ship turned towards the west, over the sea, the running sea, and by the wind was all possessed, and carried to a rich country. The second ship turned towards the east, over the sea, the quaking sea, and the wind hunted it like a beast, to anchor in captivity. The third ship drove towards the north, over the sea, the darkening sea, but no breath of wind came forth, and the deck shone frostily. The northern sky rose high and black over the proud, unfruitful sea. East and west, the ships came back, happily or unhappily. But the third went wide and far into an unforgiving sea, under a fire-spilling star, and it was rigged for a long journey. Thank you both. I'm glad you got it working in the end, the sound, because it's a perfect uh, poem to close the day on. And you know, given that the next please poem ends with the rather scary image of the ship, um, it's a perfect coming together. We've got time for a, a couple of questions. Um, things have been a bit disrupted, as you know, by the fire. Fire alarm. Does anybody have any comments to make or raise? Julian. Well, let me say that I, I went to the Skyline Ballroom on the 13th of February 1969 to see the Moody Blues. <laughs> so I did confirm it, uh, it was pretty splendid. Are you not so <laughs> Did you go on the 14th of February? That's the really important thing. <laughs> Thank you.
any other comments? Uh, for those people who, who live in Hull and have followed the uh, campaign to rescue the three ships, it has been extraordinarily um, enlightening, heartwarming, and uh, terrifically successful. Um, we've got just got to hope that contractors do their job and keep it in one piece when uh, that... Well, it's, 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 and, and you have all the information about other um, mosaics around the country and yeah. things like that, and I felt I learned so much. And then yeah, there was yeah. all that like, genuine anxiety that was going to disappear mm. um, and never be seen again. And did they find some like downpour mold or so? There was all these like, like, pestles, yeah. 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 So does the Houses of Parliament. It's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. a lovely socio artistic history from uh, the, the, the Blitz right the way through to now, and it's not finished. Okay, um, thank you.